welcome, Achievers, to your Easy Achievers Game Podcast for the week of March 28th, 2024. I'm back with you today for the small vacation I had. It was quite nice. I went to Atlanta, had some fun, went to a show, uh, the Beetlejuice musical, actually. And it was a blast. I, I loved that. And Atlanta is a nice place. Uh, I like big cities in small quantities. I quickly like to get in and get out. We were only there for like two days. I had a good time, but, you know, I'm more of a homebody. So I had my fun for the two days. Um, Atlanta is horrific in terms of traffic and how everything's designed. It's like a giant circle. I hate it, but uh, it was nice. Hotel was nice, decent. Show was amazing. I, I loved the show so much. I don't watch a lot of plays. It's only my second one ever. Watch the Book of Mormon and this one. And this was great. I, I, the The songs were fun. I had actually listened to the songs prior, uh, like a year or two ago. And two of them specifically, of course, um, uh, the whole Being Dead thing I loved. Listened to that constantly. Girl Scout was uh, another one that I loved. There's one other ones. Um, Dead Mom is always good, too. But I loved listening to them, and it was almost hard to not sing them. So I, like, sung them in my head almost when they were playing. Got to the, the ones I loved so much. And uh, it, I didn't listen to the whole soundtrack. You know, I only... My wife introduced me to the main one, so... Uh, but, the yeah, the musical's great. Loved it. Can't wait to go to another... We're going to another one in about a month. Uh, six, if you know what that is. So I will be going to that. Very interested in seeing that. I don't really know too much about it. I know the general idea, but I don't know the ins and outs. I uh, hope this finds everyone well. We have quite the news because, you know, it's, uh, we'll be capping some things off from last week, and then we're going to be going over this week's... Even with that, though, rather light news. Not too much crazy things to talk about again. It feels like we've had so much news prior to really the year starting. It feels like we haven't really kicked back up that much. It's been a little bit slower, I feel like, but it does really get let us get intimate, I feel like, with the stories. So, and get into the nitty-gritty, really expound on them. And I get to hear what you guys think about it, of course, as well. Uh, as remember, this is a roundtable discussion. You are sitting with me. So if you have any comments, disagreements, you have some sort of gripe with what I'm saying, or you just... We'd like to have a dialogue. Uh, of course, comments are open. I answer each and every single YouTube comment. And you can, of course, tweet at me at you. Yeah, a thousand. It's been a while since I've done the whole rig and roll. So remember, like, comment, subscribe, share with a friend if you can. That helps the algorithm. It's the only reason I ask. I generally don't try to pitch this too much because uh, you most YouTube people know what they should be doing. Right? I don't blame anyone for not doing the things you do. I mean, I barely like things i only like it honestly when it really deserves it almost although i should be liking pretty much everything i watch because i of course i like it because i watched it right i watched all of it so but if you can take the second interact with the video in some way comment for the algorithms these are all things that are going to help me grow of course uh i will say the show just keeps growing which is always nice it's always nice to see uh, green numbers all around constant growth uh, that's, of course, a reason, but I don't actually expect regular growth. Um, so it's been nice to be proven wrong that I didn't think it would be kind of this consistent, steady climb. So far, it has been. Uh, but I imagine at some point it'll slow down. Uh, we'll plateau. But right now, I, I'm loving the vibe that each video is getting. I, I love the kind of, again, steady climb, very slow to get views but it is steadily climbing the max i feel like it's getting higher of course the uh interview with um blanking on his name oh my god um calandra nick calandra it's kind of what started all this so i'm glad everyone stuck around or at least most people stuck around um i, I assume about 10 to 20 percent of people kind of stuck around roughly uh and kind of chicken so I'm glad that is the case. Looks like Nick Glenn just having a great, great time over there, too. I only keep up with him slightly on Twitter, and it seems like everything's going great over at Second Wind, so I'm happy for them. 
Uh, they clearly deserved it. He was very talented. He didn't have to do that. I always say this. He never had to come on the show. Uh, it was irre- irrelevant. Uh, but he did it anyways because he's just nice. Uh, he was incredibly busy that time too, so it's shocking that he did it, to be honest. So always nice. Nick will always have a special place in my heart uh, if, he, if anything ever happens. Uh, it will always be there for me, or I'll always be there for him. In any way, he would need me to. Shout out to that guy. But aside from that, it looks like we should start getting into the show. I hope this, again, finds everyone well. Uh, of course, time steps and all that no more stuff in, in, is in the description if you'd like to skip around or if there's a specific news item you'd prefer to hear first and then you go back to it. But of course, watch time helps as well. Uh, so interacting, again, interacting anyway helps the show as well experimenting a little bit with live podcasting shoot uh, soon so get ready for that i'm quite excited to really delve into live podcasting in a sense because we actually used to do it very early on in the show we probably should have never stopped i say we uh of course my former co-host would help me with that now it's just me and we would do it and it was it 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 gives you two avenues of growth i feel like some people would just tune in for for the live thing and it helps you grow in a second avenue where you're not just fully going into i guess it's really third because you have audio you have video and you would have live streaming as a sort of backup uh, and, and it's and i always love diversifying you put your eggs in one basket that's why i always like seeing of course people at ign you know they get bigger and then they branch off into their own thing. They do their own sort of media-ish content company. That's what you see, and, and that is a way of diversifying, divesting yourself out of a company. It's almost always a good thing, especially if you're talented. Um, if you are not, of course, that is not very good. Uh, and you are pretty much lying in wake. Uh, I think that's why you see so many people just kind of do it. Of course, Nick Langer is one of them. Kind of funny, kind of started that whole trajectory when the original four of them left uh, IGN and then we kind of see that happening over and over again and it's always shocking when you don't see people leave right you see the Ryan McCaffrey's you see the Damon Hatfields these very talented people still at IGN all this time maybe they're just being paid so so well uh, that they just don't feel the need to kind of entrepreneurship their way out of IGN but you know it makes sense in both directions as it's a lot safer right you know, if I got that door into that kind of mediascape, which is, of course, dying, unfortunately, I do think there will be a re- revitalization very soon with things like Substack. And once some really talented people get in there who actually do care about the journalism aspect of gaming journalism, that's something we actually are not very good at right now. Uh, we, I think we're getting better every year, actually, uh, but it's slow and I think it's taking time. But I am happy always to see that kind of growth happening. And I, I I am constantly kind of dodging on games media, I feel like, as I'm usually very negative in their thought process. But I am hopeful for the future. I think that's kind of my MO for a lot of things. I'm usually hopeful for the future. And I do think the actual gaming journalism problem, in quotes, that we have uh, is something that will rectify itself as if you let the market dictate what lives and dies, then you will only, or at least you force the people who are incredibly talented to rise for the occasion, right? I think you actually see the opposite of that happening in Kotaku. I think no one there uh, has the has it. So they are failing... Uh, horribly, and that is, of course, sad to say, we'll be talking about the our editor-in-chief opting to leave in a little bit that happened while we were gone, and of course, always sad to say, I'll never celebrate anyone losing their job, but I do have to call it like I see it and be honest, and Taku is one of the examples that I have to bring up when uh, they aren't really doing good journalism, they're not really following through, there's a lot of people on there that lack the talent and grace that is needed for something like what they're doing. Uh, All these things sound so mean when you say it out loud, and it's not to disparage anyone specifically. It's just 
when you see something like Kotaku and has such a great brand name, Kotaku, and how how much they've fallen, it's it's just really sad. And I hope one day we actually look back and Kotaku um, kind of rises from their ashes and comes back into the gaming sphere because they are needed. And I would love to see some actual competition in kind of the game journalism space because I feel like we're not seeing it. We're seeing it with Steven Tell a little bit. We're seeing it with Gene Park. We're seeing it with these very few people in these different kind of gaming spheres, but it doesn't really feel like something that started from gaming stayed in gaming is kind of leading the charge rate. IGN, it, it of course does gaming news, but it, it's just, if you go to their webpage, it just seems like just a mess of so much culture, pop culture things and, fluff pieces i guess is a word i would use to describe some of their things and uh, you know these pr things about these tv shows and movies you know lacking very critical thinking in a lot of them which is disheartening to say the least but we've uh, god wow uh, welcome to the show by the way <laughs> we just kind of started and i just started talking uh, i hope uh, i hope everyone's having fun out there but this is just my thoughts as i see them and i would never I don't know, I would never curb my thoughts, even though they do sound negative, and they are, you know, but it's just, I feel like, you know, the truth that I see it in. I do think the tools are out there for Kotaku to succeed, or maybe them branching out, like we just said, and making their own thing, leaving Kotaku behind, because we'll be talking about it later in the show, but that is uh, careening, and will very, very soon not be a site for news. It will be a game guide site um you know what let's just talk about it right now uh this is just natural uh this is the first time i've actually covered a story prior to even starting the show but let's do it uh, this is going to be in the main show but we're going to be just talking about it right now kutako editor-in-chief has resigned jen glennon wrote on her twitter that she is resigning and sites covering the story were given her resignation letter apparently geo media has told the site to double down on guides over reporting the news um all this has been reported by aftermath but the staff are expected to write about 50 guides a week for the site that's uh, ridiculous and they clearly don't want you to care about the gaming news there right geo media wants uh, SEO farming, I believe is what it's called. They want the SEO farming of the... Uh, I see it all the time when I'm looking up you know, guides for something or or maybe ideas for like builds or something in the games where Kotaku might come up and they have the like uh, top the top things that you may have missed or you know things I wish I knew, you know, th those types of guides. But, you know, with them expanding, I imagine it will be all sorts of guides. It will just pre be pretty much a guide site at that point. Uh, and we'll lose all PR. But, I mean, she stuck to her guns. You have to give it to her that she did stick to her convictions, Jen, Gl Jen Glenn. And, and I mean all this with respect. Hopefully she stands on her feet and improves from this because Kutaku, although she, I remember writing a very candid open letter to the audience of Kutaku when she came in, I think, last year. She was very candid in that that letter but it, from my point of view nothing has improved from that site it's been very rage clicked fueled it's been very it's clearly fueled to make people angry and click on it uh which is the lowest form of engagement uh and in guarantees that you will only get a negative following which is what happened which is which is what happened i'm not i'm not some sort of oracle here i'm just observing what i'm seeing and is kind of, you know, that's that's what happens. You, you when you engage in the lowest form of communication that you have with your own audience, uh, which is just partaking in the just anger click, then you foster this kind of anger towards your brand. And I can't be I I can't believe that that's happened to Kotaku. I used to look up to them. I I, I remember when I was first kind of getting into gaming news a lot uh they were the gold standard because they were blacklisted from bethesda they were blacklisted from another publisher for a while was it playstation i can't remember but they were that 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 should be a point of pride that you would get blacklisted by a publishing arm uh and it and it and i think they did for a while it's just it all lost meaning uh you know 
and it it was never really it never really kept that kind of go getter games journalist attitude I feel like it had at the start you know they they reported on I believe Oh my god, I don't even remember why they were blacklisted, but you know, they reported on an early game. I want to say it was like a Fallout 3 or something and, or 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 something like that. And this Bethesda just blacklisted them. I believe they still are blacklisted too. But it it's sad to see where how they've fallen. I I wish uh, nothing but the best for those people, but uh it is what it is, I guess. And you do reap what you sow, unfortunately. Let's actually start the show for the week. Uh, of course, we start the show every week with not so rapid fire. Uh, Rise of the Ronin reviews and Dragon Dogma 2 reviews are out. I have not had the chance to play Rise of the Ronin. I have been strictly stuck on Dragon's Dogma. Of course, I had my... Uh, I had my... They released the same day and I had my vacation planned, so I did not have time to, of course, obviously play both of them. And then Dragon's Dogma 2 was so good that I did not want to play Rise of the Ronin. I will be getting to Rise of the Ronin, but not right now. I will be strictly playing Dragon's Monk 2 until either I pitter out on it, like I did with the original Dragon's Dogma 1, or, or I'll finish it. We'll see what happens with Dragon's Dogma. But I am loving this game so far. I am vastly addicted. I'm level 40-something, I believe. Uh, I hardcore played the game when I got back from my vacation, and I'm frankly loving it. I'm loving every second of the game. I am enjoying the uh, kind of go-getterness of the game like you know oh you want to get there all right we'll go walk uh, oh you want you want to fast travel there well it's you know it costs this stone um i will say let me uh be upfront with this um there were dlc problems with the game in quotes i will say uh, there was a lot of oh you have to pay for fast travel you have to pay for xyz you have to pay for this and that and that and although i agree that that is egregious and i don't think you should do that probably in your game and if you do there should be a cleaner way of doing it than what they did uh resident evil actually and of course this is published by Capcom. if you remember resident evil 4 and i think the only reason this is not discussed about in the resident evil games is because nostalgia glasses are on those games uh the exact same type of micro transactions are in resident evil 4 um to various degrees uh the only difference is that wouldn't of course have like any fast travel buyouts or anything but if you look at them side by side, it's pretty close in terms of what you would expect in like a microtransaction sense for those games. And I think it is a little unfair that we took it out on Dragon's Dogma 2 because they've been doing that with the other games that they've been publishing. So don't know why we picked Dragon's Dogma 2 to get upset. But I do like that we are pushing back on things like this. We need to draw lines in places. So I will respect that. Uh, but it was a complete overreaction. I actually was very disheartened to originally see this. Um, everyone coming out, it's like, oh, you pay for fast travel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you pretty much you pay for like early access to these things, right? One, I don't even know why you would pay for the fast travel option because you have to like progress the game to release to unlock more points to fast travel to because it's it's an it's its own item. Uh, putting like uh, they're called i think port crystals and you can select where to put it so you can put a port crystal somewhere and then that'll be your fast travel point wherever you want to go whenever you want to do that and yet and it costs a rift stone i believe sorry mm, done that mouth i had a protein bar before this and there we go I fixed it uh and the peanuts and the protein bar was sucking my teeth um i was talking about the fast travel and I, I think it was massively overblown. You have to buy the you buy the rift stones, I believe, for like a few dollars, and then you can use that to fast travel. But it would make no sense to buy that. And also, I have so I've I've used fast traveling four times, I think, and I have twelve of them on me now, not including the four I've used. And I'm not fast traveling really much because one, you want to level, and two, part of the fun of the game is traveling so i don't i don't see why you would want to i think it would actually be a mistake if you actually rely on fast traveling in this game uh that's not the point uh you only want to do that when you are across the planet you know and, and you need to to go back and 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 move across the the planes to to get somewhere else but aside from that i i i, I 
wanted to quickly mention, I think that was a little overblown. I think it's important to draw lines, but I think this was quite the wrong game to do it. Uh, and it really got ahead of its skis. People kind of reacted, left negative Steam reviews before realizing what it was. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if many people really sat down uh, and like examined what you were even paying for that they cared. I believe they uh, had you charge for like cosmetic changes, and you could just do that in the game. Uh, uh, they tr they would charge you for fast shopping. I already touched on that. You you wouldn't. It would make no sense to buy that. Uh, you would have uh, what was that? you and you weren't buying power. It wasn't like uh, Resident Evil Four where you like buy this machine gun and you're like God or whatever. I, I don't I don't. It's not like that. Uh, and I can't remember anything else. I, I, it was stuff like that. Uh, it, it wasn't really that affecting on the gameplay. I really think people kind of overreacted a bit uh, because I have at no point have I been any sort tempta tempted to to look at micro strategy for the games. I I'll be honest, wouldn't have even known they were there if people did not freak about it. If I'm being honest, I would have probably seen it in a tweet and moved on with my life. But of course, people got upset and it was much more amplified. Uh, enough about that because I've spent way too much time on that. Uh, moving on to the actual game itself. Uh, Dragon Song 2, the gameplay, solid. Love it. Love the vocations. Love that it's so easy to switch between uh, vocations. That's the job system in the game. So, of course, you have your regular RPG mainstays, your soldier class, your warrior class, you know, your sword and shield or your great sword. And then you have your mage. You have your sorcerer. Mage is more support. Sorcerer is more damage. You have your archer and thief. You have your... Normal classes, and then you have the advanced classes that only the main pawn can do, uh, like a magic archer and etc. And all that, great. Love it. Uh, that's the best part of the game, honestly, is the gameplay, climbing onto big things, finding the next big monster, uh, fighting it for a big experience, uh, interacting with the world in, in unique and interesting ways with certain abilities you can do. Uh, I will, I, I'm remiss to say, or I would be remiss if I didn't say this, and the actual... Oh, my cat's here. The actual story elements are, I would say, incredibly bad. Uh, the writing is pretty good, I think. The actual story narrative implications of the game are very bad. You know, those two different things. The writing, I think, the banter, the dialogue is fine. I don't think any of that is actually the problem. But the actual narrative, one of the design of the narrative in a lot of these quests and the narrative design in the actual main story, I think are complete misses. I think it's pretty bad. Dragon's Dogma one actually had pretty much the same, pretty much the same situation with uh, the story not really mattering. You didn't really care about it. When I played Dragon's Dogma one at no point did I go like, what am I doing? What do I care about this? I don't remember a single quest I ever did in Dragon's Dogma one because no one really left an impeccable mark. I do like one character in this game. It's kind of the first person uh, that kind of sides with you is all I'll say. Uh, that works uh, sort of undercover for you. Uh, and I like him, but that's kind of it. I haven't really met another character that I've loved. There is one side quest that I found that was pretty good, but it's just not, it's not very good. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I found a, a, a queen in in a part of the, the the world, right? I go to her. She says, hey, there's an assassin after me, and I need you to guard me. Uh, tech, sorry, it's technically a bodyguard enlists me to help her because she couldn't get up last time. Regardless. And the they told me, like, hey, can you help me defend the queen? You have to find the assassin, right? So I'm thinking, oh, okay, so something will happen. I'll have to battle him, and it'll be really epic. Uh, no, it's essentially you start the site, you talk to the person, um, they tell you, uh, come in the morning for the sermon. So you go rest, go up there, back in the morning, walk up there. She's like, all right, the sermon's starting. In this area, the, the assassin will be, they'll be praying, pretending like they're praying. You have to find them. Here's a description of what they look like. And all you do in that quest is you read the description, you find the guy in the crowd, you grab him, and then the, the quest ends, you get a lot of money, some jewels, and then you're about your day. And that's an example of how not engaging it is. At, at something as cool as you're stopping an assassination on, like, a queen priest amounts to a Where's Waldo uh, quest. 
Very, very sad. I'll give you one more example and then I'll move on. Um, again, I do actually recommend this game. I think it's worth it if you go in understanding that you're playing the game for the game and you're not going to care about the story. As long as that's fine with you, I think this is actually solid. If you like a hardcore RPG Elden Ring-esque game where they actually very much do not tell you much at all. they You are meant to figure out the game. You are meant to read things. You are meant to, if you get a, if if they give you a note, you probably should read it because it's probably going to tell you something. Oh, vital to the game. But uh, going back to the one more example, um, the way you get the magic archer, which is like the infamous class from the game. It's what people loved in the first game. Uh, you find this guy, you escort him to a town. Uh, he does something that he needs to do. Uh, then his wife gets there and goes, Oh my god, thanks for following my husband. I was worried, so I followed you close behind and and got to the town. I was like, okay, why didn't you just walk him there? And then she's then you learn the vacation from her. And then the, the, the quest ends, and that's it. And it wasn't very engaging. Uh it, it it wasn't very interesting. You're just walking through to to get to this town. But again, what you're doing getting to the town is fun because you're just fighting stuff and it's cool. When I, you know, when you see like a Cyclops in the game, being able to jump on him and climb him and fight in a unique way every time is awesome. Uh, and then, of course, every vocation is a unique way of playing. Everything feels different. Nothing. I've I've played a uh, warrior, um, soldier, mage, sorcerer, mystic spear hand. And all of them ha have nowhere close felt the same. The closest is mage sorcerer. And in all reality, uh, you you level up like two more times in that specific vocation, and it are it feels like a whole different uh, kind of thing. So, uh, highly recommend the game. Just know what you're getting. I feel like I've spent too long on this, so I should move on. But uh, the Dragon's Armor Two um, reviews, of course, are out. If you like someone else's opinion on them, Rise of Ronan again. Don't have much to offer here. I apologize. I'll be playing that after Dragon's Armor Two. I don't really feel the rush to play to that and i don't really see much interest in that game frankly so i don't think anyone's really demanding i play to give you my thoughts on it a uh, quick thing a survey for dlc interest for dragon's dogma 2 was released and it asked questions about pricing and what you want to see in like a dlc you can actually go uh, and just look it up you'll see the survey uh, it seems like uh they might not have expected the game to be a as much of a success maybe uh because it's very uncommon for them to do this after the game so they might be like wondering what they should be making for the game now and just gauging interest uh, and like what they should make. Uh, next up, um, at GDC, Lauren Studios founder uh, Sven Vink stated at a panel that there will be no DLC or expansion for Baldur's Gate 3 or will be or will be looking into a sequel as they will be stepping away from working with the DND IP and Wizards of the Coast. Uh, so then when this originally came out, uh, it was kind of clear that, uh, I, I, oh, at least to me, it was clear that they were kind of insinuating that they did not want to work with Wizards of the Coast anymore, and they wanted to go do their own thing. Uh, there actually wasn't a clarification from Sven uh, saying the exact opposite, saying he actually liked working with Wizards of the Coast and DNT IP. He had a good time. Uh, that is not the reason. They think it's just better for the studio if they move on from this. Uh when I originally read the thing, my first thought was, yeah, you don't want to pay that uh, rights fee, pretty much. Like, the, 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 I'm blinking on what it's called. I apologize. Not the commission fee, but, you know, they're cut. The, the same thing that Marvel has, or Sony has to do with Marvel. Uh, they immediately uh, lose, uh, what was it, 15% or something? Something like a crazy percentage. Uh, is lost and they do nothing. Marvel doesn't do anything for that money. Uh, they just have to pay them to use the rights for Spider-Man, which is out outrageous when you really think about it. D and D Wizard of the Coast made probably, I mean, uh, fifty million, hundred million dollars easily. Probably more than that. Uh, maybe one hundred fifty million. Off of doing nothing, just letting them use the IP and make a game, right? That means that means um, Larian lost that percentage, the eighty, the hundred, the hundred fifty, well, you know, whatever it would be. That kind of uh, I would have to look up what it sold. It sold very well, 
obviously, but yeah, of course they had early access and all these things. But that means they lost that money. I'm sure they're like, eh, let's go back to doing our own stuff because we can use this to catapult ourselves and make another game. And so it looks like they are completely abandoning Baldur's Gate 3. Not completely. They're going to be patches in these things. But they're abandoning it in terms of DLC and expansions. And they're going strictly into their own new game, which I'm sure they're excited for because they want to make more money. Now, I will say uh, I will be switching from the... Uh, uh, gentleman who was telling you all this to now someone who has played the game and enjoyed it. Uh, this kind of disappoints me s quite a bit. Uh, there are so many open narratives that they clearly wanted to make DLC for, or at least wanted to give themselves options to make later. There's quite a bit unresolved things uh, with the main supporting cast, and it's very weird that we're just kind of leaving that or not weird i guess but saddening i guess is is a better way of putting it it it, it I, I wanted to fix carlac i wanted to finish lazelle's story i'm i'm trying not to, to spoil anything here um there's a few other things that you could work in with a lot of these thoughts and processes now will have to be filled with headcanon pretty much cuz i doubt there are gonna let someone make a sequel to this a direct sequel to this game uh i don't think any company would want to try and do Baldur's gate 3 or sorry Baldur's gate 4 uh in the style of a f straight sequel to this game i think people are, will stay far away from this in fears of the comparison to Baldur's gate 3 Baldur's gate 3 is massive so it does make me a little sad but also Larian's still gonna be around, you know. It's okay that they're doing this. It's just I wish they made one expansion closing up the narrative holes that they left. Uh they clearly left. Uh and then moved on, but you know, what are you gonna do? Marvel nineteen forty three Rise of Hydra was shown at the State of Unreal twenty twenty four. Uh uh you really should take some time and just look at this trailer to just appreciate uh, how far games are going. This is an Unreal Engine 5 game, I believe. Uh, and the the game looks amazing uh, in terms of the actual acting and the uh, movements of the face and all these things uh, that are shown off. Uh, you can watch the straight-up trailer, and then you can watch a more behind-the-scenes thing that shows off the uh, Black Panther character and his face and animations. Uh, it looks very cool. Very, very cool. Cannot wait for this game. Cannot wait to see what becomes of this. Because, of course, remember, this is the Aiming Henning game. Of course, the mind behind Uncharted 1 and 3, and most of 4, technically. Dragon Ball Sparking Zero was shown off a little. A couple more roster announcements. That's all I want to really cover. If you are looking for that uh, Budokai Tenkaichi game, this is, of course, that the revitalization of that type of gameplay style and character design and way of playing the game. So get excited. I can't wait. Cannot wait for this game. It looks awesome. I love that the new stuff is in the game and the old stuff will be returning and all the above. I, I, I don't really have much to add because it's kind of just like, yeah, you know, you know what you're getting with this. So it's just like waiting to get it. But I can't wait. I love it. Apple is being sued by the U.S. Department of Justice over antitrust issues. A number of reasons are cited for the lawsuit, but one of the reasons, and the reason we're covering it on the show, is cloud gaming. This is a quote from the uh, lawsuit. For years, Apple blocked cloud gaming apps that would have given users access to desirable apps and content without needing to pay for expensive Apple hardware because this would threaten its monopoly power. Cloud gaming apps deliver rich gaming experiences on smartphones without the need for users to purchase powerful, expensive hardware. As a result, users with access to cloud-streamed games may be more willing to switch from an iPhone to a smartphone with less expensive hardware because both smartphones can run desirable games equally well. Apple wielded its power over app distribution to effectively prevent third-party developers from offering cloud gaming subscription services as a native app on the iPhone. Even today, none are currently available on the iPhone, end quote. I think this is why we saw Apple kind of break open a couple things. I'm sure they saw this coming, uh, so they started opening up a couple things on the UE side. We cover this in the show, and 
Yeah, I can't say I disagree with any of this if I really look at it. I've actually said this for a while. I feel like even going back to the Epic Games versus Apple lawsuit, although I don't think uh, they should have like whole route one Epic Games. I, I think they make a good point with the way Apple conducts it makes it too easy for them to have a monopoly and a monopoly has kind of formed on the Apple store, right? Why would you? They we've seen them actively go against uh, cloud gaming specifically for their own interest. Right. And we're seeing them kind of wield that um, from the outside looking in, at least. And from my point of view, this is good. Uh, I'll take any antitrust, honestly, in, in the uh, American justice system. Um, uh, it's gone amok, frankly. Uh, I don't think this is very typical or uh, crazy, but yes, thank you. Yeah, do more. Yoko Shimura, Shimo Mura, legendary composer and winner of a Lifetime Achievement Awards at GDC, is working on composing for Kingdom Hearts 4, as she has for the previous games. Now, this was a slight clarification, uh, as she they said that she was working on the contract, or so, sorry, the soundtrack. Uh, then they reclarified, I was like, well, she's working on multiple games, and she she's working on a song for the game, I think is what they said, or something like that. Uh, she will be in, in, with Kingdom Hearts 4, I have no no doubts about that it was just weird that they felt like they had to clarify some things but uh, very strange but very excited obviously she would have been she'd be there for the next game but we see uh even here and what a what a composer frankly one of the best probably in uh gaming ever probably second or third Assassin's Creed Jade has been delayed into 2025, as reported originally by Reuters. Tencent took away many developers from the mobile game uh, and moved them to their game Dreamstar, which is apparently an answer to Eggy Party by rival NetEase. Uh, wow, Th that all sounded horrible and horrifying, but that is what is happening. I don't know what Eggy Party is or Dreamstar, but uh, as Reuters points out, uh, they are moving interest away from Assassin's Creed Jade. Uh, so that has been delayed into the next year. Uh, I never cared about this. I'll play it if and when it comes to consoles. I just wanted to cover it on the show. Next up, it takes two move 16 million units. This is quite astonishing uh, figure here uh, and shows that it continues to sell after all these years. And one, I think it speaks to, to, to the quality of the game. Two, I think it speaks to the void of co-op games. I think it's understated what, what happens when co-op left the gaming sphere. I think everyone said oh you know no one uses these oh we have analytics saying no one uses that blah 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 you know, I, if we do live in a market where market dictates reality almost but when i see things like that and then when i work in again i always bring it up when i worked at gamestop and i have you know i had so many people come in hey what's a good co-op game hey what's a good co-op game split screen hey what's a good split you know I, the amount of people i would get it it, it really does feel like people are telling telling me not to look with and hear with and hear with my ears and look with my eyes and discern for things because when that happened I understand the online revolution was uh huge and again this was this happened before the times of me really getting into the games industry but seeing that kind of move away from this or the the organic way that we would play co-op games and Give, just given the reason, like, oh, no one uses this stuff anymore, right? Famously, Halo dropped in that kind of signed the end of these, like, co-op games never coming back. And I, I want to say I, 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 it just seems strange, and I think this is an example of that being nonsense. This is a co-op only game. Alright, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take... Give everyone a second. Co-op only, right? You cannot play this by yourself. Same with uh, the game prior at Way Out. So I am very confused on this notion that co-op games are not used. This game sold, one, because it was very good, but two, because it filled a void that was created uh, from people saying, oh, there's, there's lack of interest, so we'll just stop stop it all right i think there's a couple famous examples i believe borderlands kept co-op uh going i think the latest 
gears still let you split screen the main game i don't know and i understand the technical side right it is incredibly hard to run the game twice on the same machine i understand that but you gotta kind of figure it out if you want to kind of get into this market right i think this is something that you could plaster on maybe a smaller game that would make sense and add this co-op mode and ship and, and, you know, pitch it like that and be like, hey, this is the co-op game that you can play with your spouse, your best friend, um, whatever situation you got going there. And really dig into it. And again, I'll say it. This wasn't something you like played single player. This was a co-op only game. Next up, an Overwatch-like free-to-play 6v6 team-based shooter called Marvel Rivals was announced and will have a closed alpha test for May. I don't have much to add here. Just saying that this exists, it kind of came out of nowhere. I think there was like a small leak right bef the day before or something. Uh, but there you go. I, I have... I don't know. Maybe I've become numb to Marvel games. I'm actually a huge comic guy. It doesn't really come up in the show that often, but... I played a lot of, or I've read a lot of comics in my day, and I don't know me just seeing another Marvel game. It just kind of, I don't, know, I don't, I don't really get excited anymore. But maybe this speaks to the genre this is coming out in. You know, how many free to play games do we need? How many of uh, of the, these hero based games do we need before we have to go? You know, the market is getting saturated again. This is just another game that needs to continue to live. Uh, this this is uh, in collaboration with NetEase and uh, let me look it up. Actually, Marvel Rivals. So I don't remember who's actually making this game. Let's look this up. Marvel Rivals. Who's who's developing? And of course, NetEase publishing and and developing. OK, so they are both publishing and developing the game. Cool. Again, this th this will be launching on, by the way, only on PCs and mobile, I believe. Uh, I believe so. I can't really remember. But, yeah, I, I, I got to really move on from this, frankly. Don't really don't really see much here. Maybe I, I saw a pretty funny um the internet reaction, you know, immediately making memes of this game. I saw one funny one. I was like, bro, you're playing Iron Man and the enemy has a Magneto. You're literally trolling. Like, I will take the game just to hear memes like that. Like, I want to hear, bro, they got Beast, swap to Wasp, man, hard counter him, right? I want to hear, oh, bro, he took out Sabretooth, hard counter with Wolverine, you know? I want to hear stuff like that. That sounds hilarious. So, I'll take the game for the memes, I guess. I don't know if people saw this. This was quite astonishing. I actually watched this live, or semi-live, on the Twitter app, or X, whatever you'd like to call it. The Neuralink patient, the, so the first human transplant of the Neuralink, um, used it to play Civilization VI uh, for the rest of the night. So I don't know if people have seen this video. It was only about nine minutes. I think everyone really should check it out because it is pretty astonishing what's going on. If you don't have the interest, I'll, I'll pretty much explain to you what the video is. So um, someone involved with Neuralink, I don't know the gentleman's name, but he was pretty much holding his phone and live streaming to X, right? Um, and... Uh, and you know, again, assumably he's with the company, but he was talking with the first human transplant of nearly. Um, oh my god, blanking on his name. It's actually. Let me let me grab Neuralink. Let me grab his name. This is actually kind of rude. Should I have his name ready? Let's see here. Noland, I can't pronounce that last name. Arbog, Ar 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 Arbo, Arbu, Arbu, something like that. He's a 29 year old, um, complete quadriplegic. Uh, he said he had a diving accident, uh, so he was paralyzed from his shoulders down. So he's a complete quadriplegic. Um, so he's stuck in this chair, but um, so and he offered him himself to the trials for Neuralink, which is a brain to computer interface that is in your brain right and he was using it to control this computer laptop he had um on his little desk 
Uh, and it was pretty strange seeing that. So uh, it opens with him kind of saying, like, you know, it took took us a while to, like, figure out how to how to have it work. Right. It took us a while to uh, like at first, um, I believe he brings up the example of like. Um, thinking of moving his hands, I think, or, or something of that nature, like thinking about moving his hands to see if the cursor would move. But then they got it kind of to work to where he looks and wants to the cursor to be there and that's how it moves i believe uh which is in the video again astonishing things you see him doing this um he was actually i believe on chess.com playing a chess game uh and he was saying that this is one of the things he actually missed from his accident he couldn't play chess anymore so this was one way he could now use uh and of course it being pertinent to the show he uh one of his main things is like hey what did you do you know the guy asked what did you do with it the first few times you had and he he's like oh i play i stayed up to like 6 a.m playing Civilization 6, which hits me specifically. Because I, well, you guys know I love Civilization 6. It's kind of the only time I turn my PC on to play a video game. Uh, if I'm using my PCs on, I'm doing stuff for here. But seeing that, it was quite... I don't know, it, it, frankly, it brought a smile to my face. But seeing someone that um, uh, has been robbed of his body, being able to interact again uh, was... was I don't know. It was it, it was nice. Uh, I think everyone should again watch the video. It's, it's pretty astounding. I think it's crazy. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It was it was cool. Uh, I think uh, I think that's all I wanted to say. He does end the stream with saying like you know this this isn't like perfect. You know there's still problems, but uh, he thinks that if you're interested, you know you should look into to like trying the trials and the uh, the reason he wanted to be a part of it because he knew this would change the world and these things. So. Uh, very nice things. He looks uh, like a very nice man, uh, frankly. Like, he looks very nice. Uh, uh, so, couldn't be more happy. Back in February, we got word for, uh, that Toys for Bob was detaching from Activision uh, to spin off into a solo studio or an indie studio, but signed an agreement uh, with Microsoft to support their first solo game and now we are having full confirmation that that has indeed happened. They have finished signing off. This is, was originally broken by Windows Central. And they pretty much gave uh, the background or sorry, um, they were given full leave, right? They worked with Activision and Microsoft to uh, leave the studio. Or I guess the publishing studio. Uh, and now they will be in indie, uh, but working closely with Microsoft, they will be uh, Microsoft will be funding their first game. Of course, we don't know what it is, uh, but they'll be funding the first game. Very excited to see what comes from Toys R Bob. I think it was clear that they were like, we don't want support uh call of duty so we can we get out of here and very cool of them to let them go i'm clear i'm i'm s most certain that whatever deal they signed um it was very nice to microsoft and activision to ensure uh they are not actually losing much i'm curious if there was a they have like first say on the first maybe five games or something or maybe uh, they have a permanent cut of about certain games. So, you know, there's so many things that could have worked their way into a deal like this. Uh, and, uh, yeah, happy for Toys for Bob. I, we need more Toys for Bob's, frankly. Uh, and this could, you know, mean Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, etc. comes back. Mark Toberman, CEO of Certain Affinity, on the official Certain Affinity website, announced layoffs. The first of their kind for the studio. About 25 jobs are going to be laid off. I believe that's about 10% of the studio. Uh, of course, Certain Affinity was working with um, uh, 343. I believe they stopped all that. Uh, Halo, not in a good place, I believe, right now. But uh, I don't really have much else to add there. So let's move on. Of course, this is the part of the show where I ask you, and of course myself, what have you been playing? Now, of course, this could be a game, a TV show, a podcast, uh, anything. What what have you been playing recently? I have been only playing Dragon's Dogma 2. I've already really spoken about it, so I don't really have anything new to add. So I'll just leave it at that. I did finish Rebirth. Uh, fantastic game. I will be replaying it. Uh, I'm going to get the Platinum in that game. Uh, non-starter uh the platinum w is going to be very fun i am very much looking forward to going back to that i might be dastardly and finish my playthrough of <laughs> drag song 2 and then go back to rebirth um i love the game i i loved my little journey with final fantasy 7 starting with the original 
about a month before the game came out, then go, replaying remake, getting the platinum, and then getting to rebirth. It was it, it flowed so beautifully, uh, and I was very happy to do that. Uh, rebirth was something special. I don't really want to sit on it too much because what I want to say about it is pretty much spoilers. So I'll just move on uh, with saying that I highly recommend the game if you have any passing interest in Final Fantasy. Uh, make sure you play Remake. Do not go in this blind. Play Remake, then Rebirth. I don't think you have to play the original as long as you understand pretty much what happened in that game. Uh, but yeah, moving on. This room roundup, a very light room roundup. Um, this made the rounds. Resident Evil 9 might be an open world game. I'm not really going to add too much. This was pretty much just rumors, I believe, around Gaming Leaks rumors and uh, uh, known leakers. Don't don't have much to add. I just wanted to throw that out there. I hope not. I hope we have a more open sandbox kind of structure. Open like have these smaller, more intimate settings versus an open world. I don't think we need to open worldify everything. Um, going quickly back to rebirth, I think that was one things where it didn't necessarily have to do is re is open world it to that extent. Although I had a good time, I wouldn't blame people for being tired of the seventy fifth Intel mission by the time the game in. I digress. Xputer released photos of a discless all white Xbox Series X, which matches the leaked FTC documents. Not much to add. The um, they have uh, you can go check out the pictures right now. I will not be showing them here. Uh, it's exactly what I said. It's a white Series X. It does not have a disc slot. That's really it. I assume they'll be selling a detachable disc drive with this thing whenever this comes out. Um, it looks like just a system refresh. Does not look like we are getting a pro of any kind for the Xbox unless something radically changes. Let's start the show for the week. Well, it's another week, which means we have to talk about Embrace Group yet again. This time, we are talking about Gearbox, the developers behind the popular FPS RPG shooter series, Borderlands, is being saved from the collapse of Embrace Group by none other, none other than Take Two, the infamous publishing giant that has Rockstar Games, the studio behind the GTA series Under the Wing, uh, and also a plethora of other studios. Take Two will be acquiring the studio for $460 million, and as reported by VGC, will be getting the rights to Borderlands, Tiny Tina's um, Wonderland series, Homeworld, Risk of Rain, Brothers of Arms, and Duke Nukem. The studios included in this attraction are Gearbox, Gearbox Montreal, and Gearbox Studio Quebec. Randy Pritchford, CEO and co-founder of Gearbox, when giving comment on the deal, said, quote, My primary interest is always Gearbox, especially our talent and our customers. I want to personally assure fans of our games that this arrangement will ensure that the experiences we have in development at Gearbox will be the best they can possibly be, end quote. This all ends uh, confirming that the next Borderlands game will be in active development. Uh, Embracer Group also clarified on their end that there were certain things they're keeping that are currently in development. Uh, everything not mentioned that they're getting, they're keeping. Um, that's really it. Uh, another slice off of Embrace Your Group. Thank God. Uh, everyone should get out of there. Um, it will not exist probably in 10 years. Uh, if I have to guess, maybe 15. This is all just spinning lifeboat. I, I will say it again. Th they never expected to actually make games. Uh, they wanted to sell this off. They never really cared about making the games. They wanted to make, they wanted to spend their infinite, in quotes, capital. And then they wanted to make it all back plus some money by selling it to the Saudis or whoever they planned on selling it to. Uh, so this thing will collapse. Moving on. We already covered the Kotaku story that would have been here. So let's move on to originally ported by IGN. Connie Booth, former legendary PlayStation executive, will be joining EA of all places. And what seems to be a potential poaching... Possibly, as people may remember, Connie Booth left under mysterious circumstances in October of 2023. Now, some rumors that were circling around that departure, as I heard from Twisted Metal and God of War co-creator David Jaffe, said she may have been fired from Sony, but it was unclear as far as I understand. So I believe what he said was, was he heard that she was full on fired. And if you believe that, which I do, I do believe him. That is pretty astonishing we're talking about someone who was with playstation before playstation existed i think she worked as at sony as like a production a product manager or something and then was around when playstation was born predates playstation oh god what six years or five years or something like that i don't remember um 
roughly around that. And we're seeing something pretty astonishing. Or we sorry, we saw something pretty astonishing with someone that with that much experience getting kicked out now. Did something happen? Was there a an, an internal dispute? Uh was she to blame for the situation PlayStation in? They have ballooned their budgets to hundreds hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. We're talking three hundred million to three hundred and fifty million to make their games now. Uh, so if they want to make a triple A game, uh, it is a prohibitively expensive cost that, uh, makes, uh, people up on high squirmy and scared. So maybe that's why maybe she was fired for something that we couldn't think of, right? Maybe there was an HR dispute or something, not saying she, she did anything bad, just something else could have happened that we just would not know about. Um, but if I had to guess, it has to be linked to the studio structure uh, maybe the ballooning budgets, maybe this games as a service thing clearly not panning out. I, I gave my original reasoning of why Jim Ryan left. Maybe he was to blame for the bungee situation and he was just given a nice off ramp, uh, because you know, he was getting older. He had been with the, for he had been with Sony for, oh my God, 30, 30 plus years, 35, 35 years, something like that. Um, I can't really remember. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I read that as not him being fired, but him being like, hey, why don't you retire? Like kind of having that air to it. But maybe not, you know, he's but, he, you know, he I don't know. they had going away parties. So it's one of those things where it's like, did he get fired? I don't think he got fired. I think he just just was incentivized to leave, I guess is a better way of putting it. But uh, let's go back to the story. We, we went on a tangent there. It would definitely be strange for Connie, a veteran of PlayStation for 34 years, to be fired, but I do not know personally. Uh, Connie Booth will be a group general manager of Action RPG and will be a, and will be covering the studio's EA Motive, Cliffhanger, and Bioware. Of course, the games each uh, will be working on will be Iron Man, Black Panther, and Dragon Age, Dreadwolf, and Mass Effect 4, respectively. I believe I, that should have everything should have been perfect there. She will be reporting straight to EA Entertainment head Laura Mile M- Mile Mio? According to IGN, Connie Booth is taxed primarily to get Bioware in line. That makes sense here. One, uh, I'm sure she made a hefty, hefty, hefty price tag on this move here. And if she was fired, which again I believe David Jaffe saying that. If she was fired, then, you know, she kind of could have went anywhere. And EA is probably the person who would have paid them the most. Now, uh, if I was Microsoft, I would have t- would have been all over that. I don't know how they keep missing talent. I think that's actually their biggest problem is they cannot keep talent and they cannot uh, incentivize talent to come to them. I think it's just because it's just it looks like a a fire show from the outside. So no one wants to get uh, interested in making it. And we've seen the same people there for a very long time. Uh, of course, with Matt Booty and Phil, and then of course, Sarah Bond now. And it, it's just, ah, you know, another miss for them. How do they let EA take this? I mean, they can easily, easily outbid EA. So I don't understand what's going on here. They could have given her options. She probably got stock options probably with EA or something. I don't know. I'm not sure, but they could have easily uh, grabbed her. They need someone to help them manage. Uh, I'm again another tangent, but it infuriates me. It infuriates me. But I think this is interesting to see. Hopefully, she does actually get. Bio- Bioware needs a masthead. It needs a. It needs a captain. It needs someone to steer them. I, I feel like from the outside they seem directionless. They try to get the people back multiple times how many times are these people going to leave before like we just give up right we we need a, we just need the new guard we need a neil Druckmann. we need a insert someone who was not there for the founding but became someone who was the was the face of that uh studio we need that in the bioware bioware is too important to just let die ea has let it become meaningless the name become meaningless right no one complains that Naughty Dog does not have their founders anymore nobody right no one cares Bioware is unique in that not unique sorry but is interesting in that way because they have lost all the people that mean in literally anything um 
over and over again. How many times have Casey Austin came in left? Right. When we see all these things happen and it, it becomes worrisome and it's been a long time since they've released a Bioware word of the game. We have to go back to Mass Effect 3. And some people still think that isn't even a good example. I think they're crazy, but some people say that. I think Dragon Age Inquisition is actually the last one. That was, I believe, 2014. So we're talking 10 years before a worthy Bioware title was come out. It's pretty disheartening. I think it was 2014. It might be 2015, but I'm going to say 2014. Uh, hopefully she steers the ship. Um, I don't think EA Motive and Cliffhanger really need much steering. Hopefully she is you know, staying with them, but Bioware is the primary target, and hopefully that is true with the IGN reporting. Sticking with IGN, we're going to be going over to an actual interview. Now, I always say this with everything we cover on the show. I want you to go click on these little things because that's how we incentivize good reporting interviews and these things. Um, so, uh, of course, I complain about game journalists and all these things. So this is my way of trying to support them in helping. So highlighting the good stuff. Ryan McCaffrey sat down with Kevin Levine to make a great piece over on IGN. Go check that out. It has... Uh, I believe some new trailers. It has a full talk with him. Uh, and it's quite fascinating. And Frank Caffrey is one of the best probably at IGN right now. So I need everyone to take a second. Go check it out. It is great. Uh, let's read a few snippets to get you going. So it gives you a, a little synopsis of what Judas is, just in case you don't know. So let's talk about it. Story arrives, you play as Judas. A young woman aboard a main... By the way, we're just jumping right into this. Again, we're going to be reading a little bit of this. But you gotta go... Give it a click. Story-wise, you place Judas, a young woman aboard the Mayflower, a city-sized spaceship on a multi-generational mission to save humanity by transporting what, what's left of it from Earth to a new planet called Proxima Centaura. You start the game having been having been reprinted yes meaning you were dead where you'll wake up and begin interacting with the holographic projections of the three leaders who run the ship tom the ship's head of security who wants to protect all of humanity by ensuring that the mayflower's original mission stays on course nefertiti the ship's nobel prize winning doctor who wants to create a civilization of full robots with no human flaws and hope who wants your help defeating herself because the existential crisis of her existence leads her to the conclusion that the deletion is the only way to end her suffering. Further complicating matters is that the three of them are a family. Tom and, Nefidi are, and Nef Nefertiti were married, and Hope is their adopted daughter. It's up to you to decide with whomever you feel like, but whatever choice you make has consequences. Doing a favor for Tom might piss off Hope and or ne Nefertiti, and vice versa. The constant push and pull is at the heart of, of Judo's, Juda, Judas's player-driven narrative. It means that no two player throughs will ever likely be the same. That's the quote-unquote narrative Legos in action. That is a reference to a GDC talk uh, back in 2014 that Ken Levine did. Again, this man very rarely talks in, uh, talks publicly. I think um, everyone should check out the interview he did with Colin Moriarty over on Last Stand Media if you want to hear more of him. And again, make sure you read this, of course. This is a great piece. We're going to be reading the first, first question. We're going to leave the rest of it for you at home to go read. So let's read the first one. I, this is from IGN. Of course, this is Ryan McCaffrey. Ken, thanks for inviting us down to play the game, and let's talk about this thing. Let's talk about Judas, shall we? Yep, so I want to start with the macro here. Video games, especially the bigger blockbuster games that you are known for making. They take a long time to make. They take longer than ever, but with this game, we're, pa we're past the 10-year mark since Bioshock Infinite. So can you tell what's taken so long? And I mean that with all due respect because it's totally a valid question. Have you started and scrapped a couple th uh, times? Or has it been trying to crack this big idea that I know we're going to talk a lot about here over that time? Talk to us about this journey. This is Ken Levine's answer. Well, yeah, you would know You would know probably more than most people. I remember I showed you the game on the whiteboard many years ago. Sort of like my whiteboard drawing of it. And it's evolved a bunch since then. But the core ideas have been really fundamentally reigned the same. And that gives you a sense of the genesis. And then I could take you through the why of the time period. And so a lot of it came with all of our games. I think we're trying to solve the thing that we wanted in the previous game, but weren't able to do. So for Ghost Story, which is Ghost Story Games, uh, that, that's history. What I've always liked to do was create characters and worlds, even going back to Thief. When I worked on Thief, the first thing I started with was this film noir kind of character in that setting. That fantasy noir setting. So I've always been very interested in characters. But characters are really hard to do in games because all of these 
all of the things that games do. Characters are really tough. You could write it as cutscenes, but those are sort of rigid and you sort of get what you get and the player doesn't get to interact with it much. So a lot of games have most of their storytelling happening in non-interactive cutscenes. That's never really been my thing. But then you've left to the, uh, these challenges of how do you convey a character if you're not cut into these big dramatic scenes. So one of the reasons I was so excited about getting the opportunity to do System Shock 2 is I think at that point, I think at that point, went the best characters... Yeah, yeah, that's how it goes. I, th I think at that point, went the best characters in video games is Shodan. So when I got my opportunity to dig my claws in that character, I was like, I need to bring her more to the forefront. I need to get the player to have a direct relationship with it. And we moved from an enemy in System Shock 1 to a sort of frenemy relationship in System Shock 2. And that was super fun. And I had Terry Brosisius, who was an amazing actress, and so we're really able to make that relationship core. But still, she was essentially a bunch of audio audiophiles in the game, and you didn't really see her, and she was just talking to you through her very fixed bits. And there was only one choice you really made with her. I think she tells you not to go into a room at some point. And you can, or you can't even discover some horrible thing she did if you do go in and she punishes you for that. And gamers love that moment. Keep uh, going on. the. So the next game I was like, okay, well, how do we bring more character? The next sort of big first person environmental game we did was Bioshock. And the graphics had evolved at that point. Enough where the world could be a character, but also we could bring Atlas. We could bring in Andrew Ryan in. We could bring in... Uh, Tannenbaum and they were doing all pretty much behind the glass the most developed characters in that game were Big Daddy and Little Sister but they weren't like dialogue characters but you saw them in the world in their ambient place and they feel like they live there and belong there but we were still like well you don't really have a character that you interact with who's not really effectively in a cutscene so with Infinite Elizabeth was a big push how do we get you to have a companion character who you feel like you're going on this journey with I'm going to leave it there. We have one more thing to go, but I'm going to leave it there because this is this is awesome. I'm going to probably read this again to really dig deep in this. I I, I love Kevin Lee. I know Bioshock Infinite is kind of hit or miss for people. Uh, definitely hit with me. And then Bioshock 1 is one of my favorite games ever made. So it's kind of my introduction in quote unquote serious games, right? Uh, when I was growing up. So uh, I think everyone should... Definitely read this interview if you have any passing interest in how games are made, the thought processes, the uh, the uh, the soup of the game, you know, how it's made, and look behind the curtain, kind of. That's going to be the show for the week. Let's go for the day updates. Let's talk about the Game Pass titles coming for... Hold on, is this, is this the old one? This is the old one, yeah. We can skip this, actually. We're going to the Predator Hunting Grounds coming to PS5 and Series consoles late this year. Uh, they are going to be con uh, continue updating, and they actually have moved away from uh, PlayStation Interactive. I'm assuming the uh, timeline for their deal is up, so they're going to be moving on to uh, other consoles later. A four-part DLC coming for Dragon Ball Z Universe 2 called The Future Saga is coming. That game is still going. People still play it and love that game, so enjoy the new DLC that's going to be coming very soon. I might dip my toes back into it because I've missed so much. I would love to try the game out again because uh, I played it when at launch, beat it, in quotes, and love the game, but I would love to, to give it another shot. Isolates from developer Kyle Thompson and publisher Armor Game Studios will be free to claim from Epic's PC Marketplace from March 28th to April 4th. So that's starting uh, today as of recording, or um, you have a few days left uh, as going live. And then the games that we're placing was actually leaked. Outer Worlds, Spacer's Choice Edition, and Thief will be free on the Epic Game Store starting next week. So that will be replacing it on Mar April 4th. And then next up, we have April monthly games for PlayStation. So this is, of course, if you are the essential tier for PlayStation Plus. You'll be getting uh, Immortals of Avium, which is, of course, a PS5 game. Minecraft Legends, which is a PS4, PS5 game. And then Skull, the hero, the horn, sl the hero slayer. Demon King Castle Defense. That is a PS4 game. And that is date update. Let's start what's queued up for the week. Now, this is, of course... It could be a TV show, a game, a movie, podcast, an audiobook, a book, manga, anything. What do you have queued up for the week? Of course, this is a question I ask you at home. You can go in the comments below or you can tweet at me. Yeah, you can a thousand. We can talk about what's queued up for the week. Now, my queued more Dragon's Dogma 2. I'll be delving into maybe Rise of the Ronin, but probably going back to Final Fantasy Rebirth to finish off the Platinum. And that's probably really it for me this week. I don't have much to really go into. We'll probably be finishing off Invincible, the, the show Invincible. 
uh, I'm very excited about. We just started like watching it again. We only watched like the first few episodes of the new season, and we like immediately stopped. So we'll be going back to that. I've been keeping up with the Destiny 2 Into the Light updates. Uh, I can't wait for all that to come out. I don't know if you play Destiny 2 at home, but if you do, uh, that update looks insane. Uh, bringing back a bunch of older weapons from, from like the Forsaken era of the game that were very popular. Uh, I can't wait. I cannot wait to play that update. Uh, there's a couple negatives that they brought up on. So uh, it's going to be time gated. You only get half of the guns when the update goes live April 9th. And then each week a new gun at, is added to the unlocks. It's so lame and dumb. I don't know why they're doing that. Who cares what's available to grab? Why do you care about player engagement week to week? The people are going to be coming back for Final Shape. No one is going to keep going. I, I'm not going to argue this. That was frustrating, but I'll be looking forward to playing it April 9th. And that's it. That's the show. Thank you so much for joining me this week. I will be going now to play more Dragon's Dogma 2 and uh, make dinner. I don't know what I'll be making today. Maybe some chicken thighs. I have some chicken thighs out, so I'll probably do that. Or maybe I'll make like breakfast for dinner or something. Who knows? But uh, again, thank you so much for listening to the show. I look forward to recording next week. I don't know why. I got a good feeling for next week. I'm not really sure. This isn't a hint or anything. I just feels like Nine Creek's show is going to be really good. I don't know if you all feel that the same way out there, but I do. Until next time, go Chief.